probably put this actually at the beginning. If, if mm -hmm. you're gonna watch this, get your notebook out because the insurance elephant is dropping a lot of knowledge on us today. I can't tell you how much I appreciate your time and you uh, just jumping on and, and chatting with us about the okay. with me. I can talk at length about anything. May not make any sense, but you know what the heck. I point blank was introduced to you by Stephen Goldstein. Uh -huh. He said, "Hey, you, there's another Patrick, and you have to go check him out on LinkedIn. He's doing this really cool uh, series about. He's calling it the Insurance Elephant. Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned, you know, Patrick Keelahan is probably how people come across you, but." Uh, mm -hmm. You told me, Pat, you go by yep. Pat just like I do. So um, please tell me a little bit about yeah. uh, your background. We'll, we'll work, uh, kind of work backwards. The last year I've been with H2M Architects and Engineers. And uh, I had worked with them during the time I was with Allstate Insurance as a claim manager and, and such and had met up with them. And we found a common ground uh, where I could work as a, uh, a liaison with uh, insurance companies as well as being a strategy guy looking down the road to what comes next. H2M is a very large engineering firm uh, working in the tri-state area in New York, Connecticut, uh, New Jersey, you know, 400 engineers and architects. We also do a forensics part, which is a, a smaller piece, but very important one. And that is the mold, asbestos, environmental uh, appraisal, you know, that those types of assignments. And uh, that's I didn't want to leave insurance and leave customers behind. All right. So I, it's, it's kind of strategic on my part. So for the last year, I've been doing that. I've gotten very involved in understanding what the insurance innovation piece is, uh, which obviously that led to us becoming acquainted through all the connections. Uh, prior to uh, H2M, of course, about 20 years with Allstate Insurance, property claims manager, which in that business, you're dealing with people every day that need something. They need to understand what's the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, they, they all have a different perspective of what a claim is. Nobody, well, I don't want to say nobody, few have experienced claims before. So you're really introducing them to a whole new something. A lot of uh, uh, concern and uh, trepidation on their part. Sitting across from someone, uh, you know, with an adjuster, we're doing the work, that person explaining, here's what comes next. And then if, if they're so inclined, they get a payment right there. And it, you see the relief for them. And it's really a very uh, rewarding business. Uh, working with agents, uh, without the agents selling things, claim people don't do anything. There's no, you know, obviously there's no policy. So there's an internal customer service piece that I enjoyed a lot. I still touch base with all state agents to this very day uh, because they're the ones that, that have to I don't want to say convince, uh, help people understand what their risk situations are. And, and I'll get into that piece in a little while. Uh, prior to that, I was with the disaster uh, program with the Small Business Administration, traveling around the country, uh, dealing with hurricanes, earthquakes, uh, all kinds of things. Spent a uh, terrible Christmas in the U.S. Virgin Islands uh, after Hurricane Maryland. Family came down. We had a condo right on the beach. But working 12 hours a day, helping folks out. Uh, prior to that, had general contracting company, owned retail stores, worked for big box retailers. That was uh, kind of out of college. So really, I hate to say it's four decades of customer service. Uh, but every job I've had has a customer service piece. And what I would tell my staff, that these, you know, gruff technical adjusters, you're customer service people first, and then you're a technical person because everybody that you deal with may not care if you write a great estimate, but they want to know what, what do I need next to go through my claim? And, and that's really a key thing in every business we do. When you talk to a customer, uh, you could say, here's everything I'm going to sell you, but they may not care that they want to know. They want you to know what they need. And they may not tell you straight up, but just talking to them, you're going to find out. You're going to find out what they're going to need. And, and that, that's a key part of uh, all the businesses I've been in. A retail store, you can put out any merchandise you want. But if, if that customer comes in and doesn't care what you have, 
they're going to move along to the next place. Or if the dirt floor is dirty, or if they bring back a pair of shoes and the customer service person gives them grief, <clears throat> that's not what they want. They, they just want to have no grief in their life, do what they need to do, move along. So all customer service pieces, all different. They've all led to this, uh, to what we're doing now. Customer service isn't hard. It's just uh, waiting for the other person to kind of tell you what they need. So that's the approach I've taken along. But that's enough about me. What else you want to know? <laughs> my, my next question is back to actually, it started on LinkedIn. Uh, the first thing that you have listed on your title on your profile description is CX. Mm -hmm. What's CX? CX is customer experience. Customer experience. That's, that's the whole thing. Why put that first as more of a direct question? Why put CX first? Because I see everybody's job. Everybody. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're the guy doing Python coding. You've got a customer that you have to serve. If there's a purpose that that person has, you need to code X, whatever the heck it is. And that person says, okay, great. I know how to do that. But they do it in a way that the next user has to work hard to understand. Not that it was a wrong thing, but the next person has a, a reason that they need that. And if the person doing Python says, hey, wh wh what are you going to be doing with this? Oh, I'm going to be doing this. And, and that Python coder then says, okay, I'm going to code it in a way that helps the next person in the line. Then he's understanding his internal customer that way. But understanding what the next person needs, or perhaps person three persons down the line. With H2M, if, if we have an insurance carrier, an adjuster who says, we don't understand what's happening with this claim, we need an engineer. And I'm not an engineer, but I talk to them, I have you know, claim background. And I say, okay, what's, what's your end goal? What, what are you really trying to determine here? Because we could go out, we can give you all the technical information. But if, if that adjuster can't take it to his manager or to the customer or the public adjuster and explain it in simple terms that the adjuster needs, then his experience is poor. <clears throat> but you haven't boiled it down to a way that they, they can experience it, again, to use that word, then you've done all the technical part you need to do, but you haven't taken care of their, their primary concern. Show me that I have what I need or show me that the product is what's going to do what I need to have it do. So I think that's an important piece of whatever all of us do. We need to be CX people, doing something to try to anticipate what the next person's need is. at the University of Buffalo where I did my grad school, I would do uh, resume reviews for graduate students. Great stuff. You know, and they all very smart. And here's all the things we can do in finance. And, and I'd say, can you do calculate out the net present value of a revenue stream 15 years down the road? Oh, yeah. And they all bright, their eyes brighten up and they start to talk about it. And I said, that's great. But so can a computer. All right. What thing can you do that differentiates you from everybody else? Because that is what you're going to sell. Three things you differentiate yourself, and I hope I can remember them all. One, you're able to take criticism and make it into something great. Two, you work in a team environment, collaboration, and make it into a great thing. And I'm not going to remember the third one, but simple little things. That's what we need to do in these environments. It, that's the CX. It's not the hashtag. It's not the only mm -hmm. technology only definition of it and that's a good segue into the second piece i referred to the insurance elephant once the kraken was unleashed as i got into social media and insure tech innovation all that stuff everybody's talking about tech and they're talking about this new program and apis and chat bots and uh but everybody's got a different piece of it and I thought that the real deal is insurance is the customer. And, and maybe one tech guy's grabbing that trunk and saying this is the elephant, the other. You know, they're all, they all have this different piece, but in this, the core of it, it's that insurance customer. It's the customers as a whole. And the elephant is not just the ear. It's not just the tail. And it just came to me. It's, it's one of the, you know, the six blind men and the elephant. So I, I wrote one piece saying this is, this is really, it's, it's, it's not all the, the little parts. It's the whole thing. 
and the customer's the elephant. And uh, one thing led to another, and I think we're six, six articles in, and a, you know, a Twitter handle, insurance elephant. Hey, if that's what makes people think that there's more to insurance than just technology, uh, then yeah, I think it's a good thing. Uh, and, and every piece I try to reinforce, innovate from the customer backwards, that's a hashtag. And uh, one of my, uh, he's a really smart guy, uh, Connections, Robert Collins. He's a consultant, uh, semi-retired CEO, but he travels the world doing this stuff. And he challenged me to stop talking about adverse selection because adverse selection is, you know, that, that's where one side's not, so, someone gets to have power over the other. And so the new approach was new insurance balance. How do we empower the customer to uh, know more about insurance because most customers don't. And it tied in with the insurance elephant because the, the elephant's there and just living his life, swishing the tail and the trunk. But all those other people surrounding him are the ones influencing what happens to that elephant. And all of us in the insurance business, we have to be cognizant that our customers are, are not really well educated with what's happening in insurance. So it's incumbent upon us to over-educate and over-serve. In mine, we, we sell the sizzle, not the steak. The sizzle is the piece that customers are going to remember. That's the, the, the stuff that induces them to you as a person selling them something. Service remains analog. Uh, so the, the insurance elephant, getting back to your question, that was my little bit of frustration saying, all right, everybody, you're talking about everything that's cool, but it doesn't help the customer as much as you think it does. So that's where the insurance elephant came from. And I'm going to ride that beast uh, until every customer's happy. Well, we're going to follow along. That's a, that's a guaranteed. Let's take a step outside of the insurance industry and mm -hmm. just say, I'm a startup founder. Mm -hmm. I, I have a finite amount of time. My resources are limited, but I want to be good at customer service. Where am I going to focus those limited resources? The, the simplest one, and you know this well, being in the business you're in, uh, listening is free. Understanding that there's not a quid pro quo to every interaction that you have. Sometimes you just listen. And if, if, if you're listening to a customer, eventually they're going to tell you what their hot button is, what it is that they need. Uh, and you can't leave every, every interaction having put something in your, I don't want to say in your pocket, to balance out the effort you put in to listen to somebody. That's the approach. If I'm a founder, well, founders, you hope they have some kind of a goal, something that they're trying to do better. That's all well and good. But what is a, what is a customer, what do most customers care? A founder needs to, to know, <clears throat> know what the customer is looking for. And it's not always a, a shiny new object. It's not only a more efficient something or other. They understand the customers, are, every one of them, I don't care who they are, they all have some kind of a hot button. Try to aggregate what that is. Uh, listen, to what, listen to what they need. And at the same, by the same token, few people go into a business dealing with customers that these customers don't also deal with somebody else. Find out what those tangential uh, services understand of what's important to those customers that this founder wants to serve, right? So don't just try to guess. Don't, don't have it in your mind, I'm going to disrupt. Isn't that a great word? I'm going to go in and disrupt this and I'm going to do it smarter and better. People may not care about it. So a founder's got to not only listen to people, but find out what, what other services are being provided to these customers. Talk to those people. What's important to them? And those people could be the founder's customers also. Because if the founder finds a way to do something better, then the people doing the tangential services are also going to benefit from it. Understand, and I'm not a big proponent of this phrase, but it works here. What's the value chain that, that those customers have? Who else are they dealing with? of services that also complement what you do. So listening is big, no quid pro quos, and find out what's important to other people that they serve or are being served by. I think that's dead on. And 
yeah. it's probably something that founders and especially in the early stage game, if you're a solo entrepreneur, you feel like mm -hmm. you really have to always be going hustle, 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 always on that, on that cell, if you will, but that patience and taking that step back and you're dead on with that. Listening is, yeah. is free. How is that founder uh, deciding how to spend the time? And that's often where they miss. They don't look at the customer focus from the start. They look at the, all right, I've got to develop this product. I've got to get funding. I've got to do all these things. And the end result is not always their focus. And boy, that's got to be flipped. They're, if they're always spending money chasing money, uh, time chasing money, and they're not listening to the customer, uh, then I think they've flipped the, the priority. So opportunity cost of chasing money is losing touch with your customer. One of the things that I always like to do in Quoted is to just kind of open up the floor and say, if people want to get in touch with you, um, mm -hmm. A, how do they do that? And B, what are the things that, that you're looking to discuss right now? The easiest way to reach me is, uh, uh, gosh, through LinkedIn's got my contacts, it's got the phone, it's got the email. Uh, so the phone's always on. Uh, I'm working on, uh, I'm hoping to have a uh, customer service type of book published early next year. Uh, so that, that's a big thing. But it's not just insurance. It's not whatever. C customer service, it's, it's a passion. If, if you can help people out, you, you've got to take what you've got and help people out. So at that point in my career, I'm not looking for the brass ring uh, any longer. I'm looking to uh, help where I can, uh, trying to persuade the insurance world that it's still a customer yeah, Matteo Carboni and I go back and forth. You know, <laughs> he's a really smart guy. But, uh, you know, we, we talk about customer service things and, uh, you know, we, we have some disagreements. But understanding how they see it and then trying to integrate it into what I do and also sneak a few words of advice into what those people are doing. Uh, I guess that's what I'm doing now. You're somebody that goes above and beyond every time. It's, it's one thing to talk about customer service. It's mm -hmm. one thing to talk about CX. Uh, it's another thing to consistently, day in, day out, be inside of that conversation. And that's you, Pat. You're engaged and talking across so many different mediums, across so many different topics, with a consistent message that always comes back to the consumer. And that's why I wanted to share the story above and beyond anything else. So I can't thank you enough. Uh, it was truly a, a, an honor to have you here, and I'm so grateful that you did take okay. your time. Great so, stuff, uh, man. So I appreciate the invite. Got nothing else I can say. Pat Keelahan, thank you so much for coming on Quota today. My pleasure, Pat. Enjoy the day. Appreciate the invite. <laughs>